So today's session, as I already told you, the first session will be by Dr. Alok Jaju sir, who is the product, uh, program director for Pediatric Neuroradiology Fellowships, and he is a radiologist at Ann and Robert Uri Children's Hospital, Chicago. Uh, he is assistant professor at Northern Western University Freeburg School of Medicine. So uh, let us start with sir's session for today. Hello, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be speaking at this MRI conference today, and I would like to thank Dr. Potker and the organizing team for the invitation. Today, I'm going to talk about pediatric posterior fossa tumors. It's something which we encounter fairly often in our clinical practice. However, it's also a topic that's been evolving very rapidly over the last few years. So, for this talk, I'm going to talk about the classic imaging features of the posterior fossa tumors. I'll provide an overview of the new molecular classification, and I'll also discuss how these molecular subgrouping impacts the clinical management as well as the imaging protocols. And then I'll briefly touch upon some future directions. So, central nervous system tumors are the leading cause of cancer-related mortality in children. These are the most common solid tumors in children, second only to leukemia and lymphoma, and they account for 20 to 25 percent of all pediatric cancers. Of the CNS tumors, the posterior fossa tumors is a particularly important subgroup which accounts for about 50% of all intracranial pediatric tumors. So the four big posterior fossa tumors which we always talk about are medulloblastomas, cerebellar pilocytic astrocytomas, brain stem gliomas, and ependymomas, and these would be the focus of my talk today. There are certain less common posterior fossa tumors such as ATRT and choroid plexus tumors, which should be considered in the differential diagnosis in the appropriate scenarios. Uh, and I will discuss them briefly. Then there are certain other tumors which are seen only in the setting of uh, genetic syndrome. Let's start with medulloblastoma. Medulloblastoma is the most common malignant brain tumor of childhood. It's also the most common posterior fossa tumor accounting for about 40% of uh, posterior fossa cases. It is a dedifferentiated WHO grade 4 tumor and uh, it belongs to the category of embryonal tumor. The peak age for medulloblastoma is 4 to 10 years, although it can be seen from infancy to adulthood. About two-thirds of these tumors are located in the midline, involving the fourth ventricle, although they are centered more towards the roof near the vermis. Um, although a one third of these patients, one third of this tumor can also be eccentric either in the CT angle system or along the cerebellar peduncle, and we'll talk about them in a bit. This is the typical imaging appearance of a posterior fossa medulloblastoma. On the non contrast head CT, we see a hyperdense mass centered in the fourth ventricle, which on MRI demonstrates diffusion restriction, ISO2 hypointensity 2 signal, and mild but diffuse post contrast enhancement. The most important imaging features that help you distinguish medulloblastoma from other posterior fossa tumors is the high hyperdensity on CT and the diffusion restriction on MRI. Both of these are features of high cellularity and high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, which is characteristic of these high-grade tumors. On a MOS spectroscopy, we see the expected high choline, low NAA peak, and a small lipid lactate peak, suggesting a high-grade tumor. Uh, this was an intermediate TE uh, MR spectroscopy. However, at a low TE MRS, presence of taurine peak has been uh, described as a more uh, specific finding of medulloblastoma. On the perfusion imaging, we see diffusely increased perfusion throughout the tumor. So this medulloblastoma was a classic subtype based on histopathologically. So traditionally, medulloblastomas have been classified on the basis of pathology with the classic subtype being most common, accounting for about 70% of cases. The second most common is desmoplastic or nodular, which accounts for about 16% of cases, although it's the most common subtype in, in adults. Uh, and, and the last subtype, anaplastic or large cell medulloblastoma, accounts for about 10 to 15% of cases, but it has the worst prognosis. More recently, based on advances in, in methylation techniques and uh, genetic profiling of these tumors, Four very distinct subgroups of medulloblastomas have been described. The, uh, these are wingless or the vent, which is the least common, accounting for about 10% of cases. It's seen in slightly older children with a peak age of 10 to 12 years. Uh, typically corresponds to the classic histopathological subtype, and it has the best prognosis of the four, uh, four medulloblastoma subgroups. Next is the sonic hedgehog, um, which accounts for about 30% of these tumors. 
uh, this subgroup has a bimodal age distribution and it's seen in infants and then another peak is seen in adolescents and adults. Histopathological age corresponds to the desmoplastic variant of the medulloblastoma and it carries an intermediate prognosis. Further, the prognosis of chronic hedgehog group is dependent on the status of T53 mutation with the TP53 uh, gene mutation corresponding to a worse prognosis compared to the wild type. Uh, then we have the group 3 medulloblastoma which accounts for about 25% of cases. It's typically seen in infants and young children and it has the worst prognosis of all the four subgroups. And finally, group 4, which is the most common subgroup accounting for 35% of cases, are uh, seen in slightly older children with a peak age of 10 years and it carries an intermediate prognosis. So the importance of these molecular subgroups has uh, significantly increased in the recent years and now these are being used for risk stratification and treatment planning. This is also reflected in the most recent WHO classification from 2016, which now di divides medulloblastoma along uh, according to genetically defined subgroups as well as histologically defined subgroups. For an individual case, the onus is on the pathologist to take into account all the histological, immunohistochemical, and genetic features and come up with a unifying diagnosis as part of possible. Uh, there are certain imaging implications of these uh, subgroups. Uh, these subgroups tend to have slightly different imaging appearance and also uh, clinical behavior in terms of metastatic spread and recurrence. So the wingless subtype, like I said, has the best prognosis, and these group of tumors are typically located eccentrically, either in the CP angle or in the cerebellar potential region. These are typically diffusely enhancing uh, lesions, and metastatic spread is rare in these tumors. Sonic hedgehog, uh, like I said, corresponds to the desmoplastic variant and accordingly it is seen more peripherally along the cerebellar hemisphere, may abut the dura along the tentorium. These are typically enhancing tumors and metastasis is relatively less common in these tumors. And recurrence is also uncommon for these tumors, but when it occurs, it's more, most likely to be in the local surgical bed. For group 3 and group 4 tumors, both of these tumors occur in the midline, the big difference being that the group 3 tumors are typically enhancing while the group 4 tumors are non-enhancing. Uh, metastatic disease is very common with both of these subgroups at presentation and when they recur, the recurrence is almost always at a distant site rather than in the local surgical bed. Uh, these are two different patients with different subgroups of medulloblastoma. The patient on the left side has a heterogeneously hyperdense mass centered in the right cerebellar peduncle with fatty diffusion restriction and post-contrast enhancement. Also on the T2 weighted images, there is heterogeneous appearance with hemorrhage and cystic chain. So based on the location, uh, this is most likely a wind subtype, which it turned out to be. Uh, the tumor on the right side is a lobular hyperdense mass, which is along the, along the lateral aspect of the cerebellar hemisphere and it's abutting the dura. The mass amount is diffusion restriction, low signal on T2-weighted images and diffuse post-contrast enhancement. Morphologically, this suggests a desmoplastic subtype and it belongs to the molecular group of chronic hedgehog uh, T53 bile subtype. These are two midline posterior fossa tumors. Um, so the tumor on the left is a diffusion restricting T2 hypo-intense mass involving the fourth ventricle. The mass also demonstrates diffuse post-contrast enhancement. Also, there is some nodular enhancement along the cerebellar folia, as we can see on this C1 post-contrast as well as the post-contrast T2 flare imaging. So this is a this is a group 3 medulloblastoma with associated leptomeningeal spread at the time of diagnosis. Um, and this tumor on the right of the screen is again a diffusion restricting T2 hypointense mass centered in the post ventricle, but this tumor shows minimal to no enhancement and this is this corresponds to group 4 uh, uh, subtype of medulloblastoma. Certain advanced imaging techniques have been used to try and predict these molecular subgroups. This study was able to distinguish between sonic hedgehog and group 3 slash group 4 tumors using low TE MR spectroscopy. What they found was that sonic hedgehog tumors typically have a have a prominent choline peak and a prominent lipid lactate peak but lack of a taurine peak while group 3 and group 4 tumors uh, readily demonstrate presence of a taurine peak with relatively small lipid lactate peak. 
Also, there are multiple attempts being made to use machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence technique uh, to distinguish between different molecular subgroups of medullary blastomas as well as uh, uh, to predict response to treatment. Uh, one such study which used um, which used radiomic uh, feature extraction technique uh, was able to distinguish between sonic hedgehog and group for medullary blastoma. Uh, CSF discrimination, like I said, is fairly common in medullary blastoma. It's seen in about 11 to 43 percent of the patients. It can be intracranial and or intraspinal. Uh, this is most common in group three and group four, and rare in the other two molecular subgroups. Hematogenous metastasis to bone and liver has been described, but is a it's extremely rare. So these are two different patients with disseminated metastatic disease. The patient on the left side has a small diffusion restricting and enhancing fourth ventricular mass with extensive leptomeningeal metastatic disease along the cerebellum as well as uh, throughout the spinal cord including the fecal sac terminus. Again, this is one of, a com one of the common imaging appearance of group 3 medulloblastomas where the primary tumor can be relatively small even in the presence of extensive metastatic disease. The patient on the right side has a sizable ventricular tumor which only denotes mild and patchy enhancement, but there is extensive metastatic disease throughout the cerebellar folia and on the surface of the, uh, surface of the spinal cord. In addition, there is this enhancing E2 hyper entrance intramedullary lesion within the lower spinal cord. Uh, which corresponds to a drop metastasis within the central canal of the spinal cord. Um, as we said, group 4 tumors can often be non-enhancing or minimally enhancing, and that is also reflected in the metastatic disease. Oftentimes, the mess can be non-enhancing. For example, in this patient, it's very difficult to identify the metastatic disease on this post contrast even rated imaging. However, we can readily see these modular mets along the cerebellar folia on the diffusion weighted and the post-contrast flare images. It's very important to obtain the flare imaging post-contrast for these uh, uh, tumor patients and it's also important to look at the diffusion weighted and the post-contrast images very carefully, not just in the resection bed but elsewhere to look for leptomeningeal metastatic disease. Another technique that can be helpful um, in problem solving could be uh, diffusion weighted imaging in the spine. For example, in this patient, there is this nodular metastatic focus along the dorsal aspect of the thoracic cord, which is seen more conspicuously on the diffusion weighted images. Similarly, there are two additional nodules along the cord I find now, which are seen slightly better on the diffusion weighted imaging. Um, another technique which we have started using routinely in all our drop metastasis MRI protocol is a 3D high resolution T2 sequence like a KISS, PS, or a space. Um, for example, in this case, we see these two nodular foci along the ventral and dorsal aspect of the chromis medullaris, um, which we can also see on these coronal reconstructed images. And I think one of the advantages of this technique is that it is 3D and you can get nice axial and coronal reconstruction. And personally, I have found coronal reconstruction to be very helpful in many of these cases. So these two nodules are almost impossible to identify upon the post-contrast T1-weighted images. You can faintly see them on the diffusion-weighted images as well. Uh, moving on to next posterior fossa tumor, which is the cerebellar pilocytic astrocytoma. This is the second most common posterior fossa tumor, accounting for 30 to 35 percent of cases. These are benign astrocytic tumors, the blue HO grade one, and they typically have an excellent prognosis with resection only without the need for chemotherapy or radiation. Uh, the peak age is 5 to 13 years, equally common in male and female. 50% uh, of these occur in midline location and 50% are hemispheric. The typical classic imaging appearance of a JPA, which is a cyst with an enhancing neural module, is seen in about 50% of cases. In about 40 to 45% cases, uh, there is a larger solid component with a central necrosis or cystic area and less than 10% of these tumors can be completely solid and non-necrotic. So this is an example of a typical JPA. We see a mixed solid and cystic mass in the right cerebellar hemisphere with associated basis and edema, mass effect, uh, obstructive hydrocephalus. Uh, the fluid component does not suppress completely on flares, suggesting proteinaceous composition. Uh, and the solid component is hyper-intense on T2 and lacks diffusion restriction 
uh, which are both useful feature in distinguishing it from higher grade tumors. The solid component also demonstrates diffuse post contrast enhancement. This is the second morphological type of JPA where we have a predominantly solid mass with the central necrotic area. Again, the solid mass is hyper intense on T2, does not demonstrate diffusion restriction, and there is diffuse and avid post contrast enhancement. Uh, this is a midline posterior fossa mass which is mixed solid and cystic. Uh, the solid portion is hyper intense on T2, does not demonstrate diffusion restriction, hypodense on, on uh, CT and has diffuse post-contrast enhancement. If you just look at T2 and the post-contrast imaging, this can be difficult to distinguish from a majoroblastoma. However, the diffusion rated and the non-contrast CT images can be very helpful in, uh, in making that distinction. A brief word about the molecular alterations that can be seen in JPS. This is the mitogen activated protein kinase or the MAPK pathway, which is probably one of the most important oncogenic pathway in human cancer. It's implicated in pediatric low-grade tumors, some of the adult tumors, as well as in many cancer predisposition syndromes like NF1 tuberous sclerosis and certain hematomas syndrome. As far as JPAs are concerned, the most important genetic alteration is seen in the PREP molecule. So there are two types of BRAF mutations identified. One is the BRAF fusion, um, which is seen in about 70 to 80% of posterior fossa JPAs. And some authors now equate the presence of BRAF mutation to the diagnosis of JPA. And this is typically associated with better prognosis. The other mutation is the BRAF B608 B point mutation, which is seen in only a small percent of posterior fossa JPA, maybe a slightly higher percent of the of the supratentorial JPA, like those involving the optic pathway and, and the hypothalamus. And also this mutation is seen in various other glial and glioneuronal tumors. This is associated with worse prognosis. Uh, the importance of BRAF testing is that there are a lot of molecules along the pathway which are targets for, uh, for chemotherapeutic agents. Uh, for, for a cerebellar JPA, it is sometimes less important because the tumor is restricted completely and may not need chemotherapy, but for low-grade tumors in non-resectable location like brain stem or the supracellular system, the importance of BRAF uh, testing cannot be emphasized enough. Uh, moving on to the next posterior fossa tumor type, which is the brain stem glioma. This is the third most common tumor, accounting for 50 to 30 percent of cases. This is not one tumor entity, but it's a heterogeneous group of astrocytic tumors whose histological subtype and grade is predicted by their location within the brain stem. Uh, so briefly, let's talk about the various anatomical locations in the brain stem where the tumor can occur. So the brain stem is divided into midbrain, pons, and medulla, uh, with the pons being separated from the midbrain by the pontomesencephalic sulcus and from the medulla by the pontomedullary sulcus. Each of these regions is further divided into a ventral or a basal portion and a dorsal portion called tegmentum. The tegmentum forms the floor of the cerebral aqueduct and the fourth ventricle, while the roof is formed by the tectum and the cerebellar cortex. So the most important uh, brainstem tumor is the one that arises in the basal or the or, or basal or the ventral aspect of the form and is uh, typically called DIPG or diffuse intrinsic point in glioma. These are high-grade tumors, very aggressive and have an extremely poor prognosis. The second tumor type in the brainstem could involve the midbrain, either in the tectum, which are typically grade 1 tumors. They do not require any treatment other than CSF diversion, or they can arise ventrally in the midbrain when they can also extend into thalami. These are also typically grade 1, but can be more infiltrative grade 2 to 3 tumors. When these tumors occur in medulla, they are more common along the dorsal aspect, and they can have an exophytic component extending into the overlying extraaxial space and can involve the cervical spinal cord. And finally, the least common group of the dorsal pontine tumors, these are lower grade and the main importance is in distinguishing these tumors from the more aggressive ventral counterparts. So, DIPG has been renamed in the most recent WHO classification as a diffuse midline glioma which has this signature genetic alteration of K27M mutation within the H3 histone. DIPGs account for 60 to 75% of all brain stem tumors. They are fibrillary astrocytic tumors. They are, on histopath, they are grade 2 to 4. However, for practical purposes, they are all treated as grade 4 tumors because of the uniformly poor prognosis. 
the peak age is 3 to 10 years and they are equally common in male and female uh, the typical clinical presentation of these brain stem gliomas is ataxia and cranial nerve palsies like in the 7 year old child and this is also the typical clinical imaging the typical imaging appearance um, on mri so we have this large t2 hyper intense heterogeneous infiltrating mass involving the pons the mass extends exophytically into the prepontine system encasing the basilar artery on the sagittal images we can see that the mass is centered more ventrally within the pons with with mass effect on the floor of the fourth ventricle there is no associated diffusion restriction there is no post contrast in the uh, no post contrast enhancement in the mass and the mass also extends into the right cerebellar peduncle and can sometimes also extend into the cerebellar hemisphere a lot of imaging features have been studied uh, as predictors of prognosis is within DIPG the two more, the two imaging features which have been consistently associated with poorer prognosis are presence of necrosis and ring enhancement and diagnosis and extrapontine extension into the cerebellar peduncle however vertical extension into midbrain or medulla is typically not associated with poor prognosis then there, there are certain advanced imaging uh, parameters which have been associated with worse prognosis which include high relative cbv and k trans on initial perfusion imaging and low diffusion values based on a adc histogram another thing to remember about these tumors is that the imaging appearance can change rapidly after radiation treatment for example these tumors can show increasing areas of enhancement and necrosis after radiation and that should not be confused with um, progressive tumor the adc values typically decrease after radiation and which may be attributed to increasing base base genetic edema uh, from the radiation uh, however on uh, mr perfusion the cb values can transiently increase after radiation again it's something useful to know about as it should not be confused with tumor progression one of the most useful predictor of tumor versus uh, pseudo progression is the tumor volume on the t2 weighted images and also you can use uh, mr spectroscopy as a problem solving technique i briefly talked about genetic mutations in dipg so k27m is the characteristic mutation which can involve the strom 3.1 or 3.3 and there are slight clinical differences in, in, in between these two subtypes the 3.1 mutation is seen in a slightly younger age group 4 to 6 years and has a has a longer survival while the 3.3 mutation is seen in slightly older age group and uh, is associated with a slightly worse outcome other brain stem tumors can involve the medulla or the midbrain and these are typically lower grade tumors as we already discussed uh, these are two different patients the patient on the left is an 11 year old child who presented with a large infantile t2 hyperintens mass involving the medulla with exophytic dorsal extension as well as extension into the cervical spinal cord uh, there is no diffusion restriction within the tumor and the solid portion demonstrates heterogeneous but avid post contrast enhancement so this was the grade 1 jpa however it is in a non resectable location similarly uh, we have another tumor which is centered in the midbrain involving both the tectum and the tegmentum with hyper intense on t2 weighted images no diffusion restriction they must be patchy post contrast enhancement again this was a lower grade tumor moving on to the last major posterior fossor subtype which is the ependymoma ependymomas are the least common accounting for 10 to 20% of posterior fossor tumors these are glial tumors with ependymal differentiation and they are typically who grade 2 but they can be grade 3 and rarely grade 4 Uh, the peak age is slightly younger than medulloblastomas and jpa seen in one to five year age group most of them are sporad- sporadic although they have been associated with nf2 in addition to schwannomas and meningioma uh, based on uh, the morphology the tumors can be uh, can be divided into mid floor type lateral type and roof type the mid floor type is the most common which involves the fourth ventricle and is centered uh, in close relation to uh, to the dorsal aspect of the brain stem lateral subtype is slightly less common as it centered in the cp angle system and the roof type is the least common of the three uh, on imaging these tumors are typically more heterogeneous than medulloblastoma and tps calcifications are very common seen in about half the cases and you may also see hemorrhage and cystic change 
Another important emerging feature is this plastic appearance of the tumor where it insinuates to the fourth ventricular outflow foramen arm. On the diffusion-weighted imaging, these tumors have intermediate diffusion between medulloblastoma and JPA. So this is a four-year-old child with a typical mid-floor type of ependymoma. On CT, we have a hypodense mass with scattered complete calcifications and obstructive hydrocephalus. Uh, on MR, we see a T2 hyperintense mass which extends throughout, uh, which extends through bilateral um, foramen of Lushka, extends dorsally through the foramen of Majandi, and extends inferiorly into the cervical spinal canal. The mass does not demonstrate any diffusion restriction, and there is a mild patchy post contrast This is an example of the lateral type of ependymoma, which is centered in these cerebellar pontine angles. Again, it's a T2 hyperintense mass without any diffusion restriction and demonstrate diffuse post contrast enhancement. The lateral type of medulloblastoma typically have a worse prognosis compared to a mid a mid floor type, partly because of difficulty in obtaining a complete surgical resection given the presence of important neurovascular structures in that location, but also partly because of the more aggressive genetic subtype associated with these tumors. CSF dissemination can occur with ependymoma, but it's much less common compared to ependymoma. Uh, and if you see CSF spread at the time of diagnosis, then you should consider the anaplastic subtype. Uh, the genetic subgroups of ependymomas are not as well defined as medulloblastomas and JPAs. However, more recently, the infratentorial ependymomas have been have been divided into two major groups: the posterior papa type A, which is the, also the pediatric type and more commonly seen in midline, and the posterior papa type B, which is called the adult type, which is more commonly seen in the triangle system, and it has it has a worse prognosis compared to type A. Also, based on genetic studies, it has been recognized that the infratentorial, supratentorial, and the spinal ependymomas are distinct disease entities, and they have uh, different genetic mutations. And these subtypes of ependymomas may uh, are most probably going to be included in the next WHO classification, which comes out in 2021. A brief word about some of the less common posterior fossa tumors, including ATRT and choroid plexus tumors. Um, ATRTs are rare tumors seen in children less than two years of age. These are WHO grade four tumors characterized by the presence of rhabdoid cells, and the signature genetic mutation is the loss of INI1 or the BRG1 gene. These can occur both supra and infratentorially. However, um, half of them are located in the infratentorial location. These are on the differential diagnosis for medulloblastomas because of their hyperdensity or CT and presence of diffusion restriction on MRI. However, uh, these are typically seen in much younger age groups. Uh, as we can see, this 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 uh, this, this, is, this patient was only three months old. So, so the young age in association with relatively heterogeneous appearance of the tumor can help you suggest the diagnosis of ATRT, uh, although you may not be able to completely distinguish it from medulloblastoma. Choroid plexus papillomas, these can occur in pediatric as well as adult age groups. The pediatric tumors are more commonly located in the lateral ventricle, while the adult tumors tend to be located in the fourth ventricle. The key imaging features of choroid plexus papilloma is the morphology of the tumor. They have this lobular frond-like appearance um, uh, to, to the margins. These are typically hyperintense, demonstrate post-contrast enhancement, and speckle calcification is very common, seen in about 25% of uh, Patient. So this is an 18-year-old with choroid plexus papilloma. We have a hypodense mass centered in the fourth ventricle with multiple complete calcification. The mass is hyperintense on T2-weighted images, does not demonstrate diffusion restriction that there is diffuse post-contrast enhancement. Uh, so like I said, this is this lobular and frond-like morphology of the tumor should be your clue to distinguish them from other tumors like JPA and ependymoma in this location. So in summary, I talked about the four major posterior fossa tumors. I talked about how location, morphology, and diffusion restriction can be extremely helpful in distinguishing between these subtypes. I talked about the evolving molecular classification and uh, how it applies to imaging. And finally, I spoke about some prognostic indicators uh, based on imaging. For future, given the rapid advances in the in the molecular subtyping and the treatment protocols of these tumors, our conventional imaging may not 
provide adequate information to guide uh, the precision medicine. And we need to really rethink the rad path approach we have uh, for our image interpretation. It probably needs to be more a rad molecular approach going forward. The goals of imaging in future should be to predict the molecular subtype. And the important being, when the patient goes for surgery, uh, the only information surgeon has is is, the, is imaging. And, uh, and, and, and oftentimes, surgeon is faced with a dilemma uh, between achieving a complete resection versus risking neurological deficits, especially for tumors such as medulloblastoma, which can be closely related to brain stem. Uh, having some idea about the molecular subtype can help them decide how aggressive they need to be in trying to remove that last bit, bit of tumor. Also, uh, molecular subtyping uh, can take a few weeks to a few months depending on your access and resources. And uh, imaging-based uh, predictions can then also be very helpful for treatment planning in terms of radiation chemotherapy. Another goal of imaging should be to identify quantitative imaging biomarkers which can help predict response to these novel therapies. Uh, to this end, multiple advanced imaging techniques including uh, diffusion or fusion and MRS techniques uh, are being looked at. However, the most potential is probably with AI and machine learning techniques, whether you are using a radiometric feature extraction or a CNN-based deep learning technique, and it would be interesting how these pan out in the future. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions or if you like a copy of this slide, please free to email me. Thank you so much.